users. So at that point, I think uh, we'll go ahead and hand it off to, to Ethan. And if there's any questions, you can always uh, email uh, uh, or put in the chat box or email afterwards or talk to oh. Chris and I about the IMF in particular. Um, before, so thank you. Oh, yeah, uh, before we do that, I just want to mention that Michael had put, Michael Cohen had uh, entered uh, something in the chat about the issue of non-English keyboards and non-Roman character entry. So I guess that's something that's under development or that needs to be thought through. And Ethan has responded. So I don't know, Ethan, if you want to talk about that a little bit before we... Just briefly, I mean, okay. all of these points absolutely have been like taken into account in in guiding the future development. And you know, as I'll as I'll get into in, in my presentation, I mean, so many of these things are are, are absolutely technically possible, like uh, selecting a different keyboard and and passing the input, um, sending different you know more sophisticated combinations of of keys like page down, page up buttons, um, and it, it's just a matter of you know polish and scaling um, you know, the, the platform and, and making sure the assurance, the quality assurance is there. So, um, I, I mean, but this is, this is the point is to, was to get this in what we have in front of you all um, so that you would give us that feedback about what the platform needs to do. Um, so that seems a good transition okay. into my section. Um, if anyone Great. Knows. Yeah. And I'm going to stop sharing. So you take over Ethan. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, one moment. All right, can you all see my screen? The, yes. The reservation slide? Awesome. Um, so thanks everyone. I'm really happy um, and excited that the Stanford team asked me here today on behalf of the EASY team to talk to you all a bit more about our program of work and basically how, uh, what we do and how, um, you know, the demo uh, that Ron and, and Michael just showed you is, is possible. Um, and I'm also really glad that we kind of kicked things off with this IMF use case in particular, because it's a really good entry point into us considering, you know, the broader implications for software dependent data in the field of digital preservation, sort of the wider problems that this leads us to. Um, you know, we, you can see the challenge of both preserving the content in, in those IMF CD-ROMs, so the, the data sets themselves and the variables, but also the, the context, you know, the fact that they were distributed and interacted with as CD-ROMs in a Windows XP environment or possibly even earlier matters um, when we're talking about scholarly research. Um, and, and, you know, we all know the pace of, of technological change means that files, formats, fonts, software, hardware, peripherals, et cetera. Um, things, computing pieces from even five years ago are no longer supported or accessible, much less as, as we've gotten into 10, 20, 30, 40 years, as we've heard in all of our, our, our wonderful opening icebreaker uh, uh, questions. Um, so, so when we talk about digital collections and content coming from those different areas of computing, converting or migrating that content, um, you know, is it even possible is a big question. And even if you manage, you know, in the process of, of converting the content into something that is usable in a contemporary computing environment, um, is, is the context preserved? Um, do, do they actually render as they were intended to be seen? Even if the, the, the bits and the bytes, the zeros and ones are all still there, is that actually what, um, is that translating to what the user is seeing and accessing? Um, what about the aesthetic and the form of interaction? What about, um, you know, just all these questions of how are we delivering digital collections to patrons? These are the kinds of the questions that we're obsessed with in the Software Preservation Network and in the EASY project. So I do wanna, want to kind of back up for a minute here and take a little time to get everyone on the same page when, um, you know, when we talk about software preservation and we talk about emulation, what do we talk about? So when we say, again, in software preservation network land, when we say software preservation, we're talking about policies and procedures for the collection, description, and maintenance of files and information necessary to operate software for the purpose of study or to provide access to digital objects. What that basically boils down to is, is developing a framework for treating software as itself an object of preservation, you know, uh, 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 elevating source code, 
executables, applications, um, to the same level of preservation and care that we do with, with general digital collection materials, you know, the PDFs, the text files, the office files that were photos, et cetera, that we're kind of used to um, um, dealing with in the digital preservation world. You know, how, what exactly, when you treat software as a collection, what do you have to document? Um, how can it be used and by whom in what contexts uh, in, in a library or an archive uh, uh, context? Um, what, what dependencies are critical? Like how can it actually be run? It's very difficult when you're talking about software as preservation object um, to keep in mind that the raw materials of software isn't necessarily enough to make software understandable or usable by a future user. Unfortunately, un unlike just a plain text file, you can't just open it and, um, and necessarily get the same interaction that was originally intended um, when you try to run a .exe that was originally intended for Windows 3.1.1. Preserving those bits, again, bytes, again, is, is just one piece of the puzzle when we're talking about something that's meant to be executed or, or operated. Um, so how do we operate legacy software on our current contemporary computing setups when there are issues with system compatibility, you know, programs that were written for a specific operating system or CPU architecture? Um, when they are dependent on, on obsolete software libraries that you might not have access to anymore, when they are dependent on um, security features. So, uh, uh, you know, if you've ever tried to access a, a you know, really old website on a modern browser that, uh, uh, you know, or I should say when old browsers try to access contemporary web material is the more <laughs> likely scenario for this case to come up and, and they don't understand contemporary HTTPS security protocols and the site breaks. It's all a matter of, of, of trying to provide functioning manifestations of software that support access as it was intended. And this is where emulation comes in. So emulation, which again, Many people, if, if, if they've heard about it coming into these discussions with the easy program, have probably <laughs> encountered it in the context of video games and, and, and playing consoles on your desktop, et cetera. But it's a really broadly applicable term in computing, which just refers to using software, uh, the use of software or recreating computer hardware and operating, sorry, the use of software to recreate computer hardware and operate computer systems and legacy software on, on host infrastructure. So again, broadly speaking, when I try to explain what I do to, to family or friends, it's about, I'm, I'm trying to run old computers on, on newer computers, which is a bit simplistic, but it, it usually gets people there. The idea is that the, an, an emulator, which is itself another piece of software, which is a whole other um, sort of rabbit hole to, to get into, Using an emulator, you can mimic the functionality of, of physical computer hardware. Um, and, and if you combine that with disk images, and, and a disk image is a, is a file containing the contents and structure of a, of a disk volume of a physical data storage device. Um, if you use a disk image then to, to recreate storage components, yeah, so a hard drive, a USB, a CD-ROM that has data on it, we can mix and match these two things together and actually recreate legacy computing environments. Um, so just to, to visualize again what I'm talking about here and, and, and put it in an a emulation as a service easy context, if you consider the, the physical co uh, computing environment that's in front of you right now, your own laptop, um, it's a combination of, of hardware, right? A keyboard, mouse, touchpad, um, screen, uh, a RAM, a processor, et cetera. All these, you know, hunks of, of, of plastic and, and, and metal and circuitry that come together to, to execute um, the directions given to it by software. Um, you have uh, some sort of, of, of bootable system. So that would be, uh, your either a hard drive on a desktop, increasingly solid state drives on, on your laptops, but the thing, the storage device that contains your operating system, file system, drivers, applications, the things that just sort of come with your computer from, from Go, the things that again are required to make it work. Um, and onto which you generally load additional software or content, right? Um, on flash drives, on external hard drives, floppies, CD-ROMs, that's, that's additional software or content, um, more applications, more 
personal files. So if, if we think about moving from the physical environment into an emulated or a virtual environment, what does that actually mean? Uh, we break this down into the same basic categories of components, but basically the emulator is what is going to take care of all the hardware pieces for you. Um, so the, the emulator recreates hardware components, and then we have various kinds of disk image that will handle either um, your, you know, your kind of your system drive, again, that has your operating system and applications on it. And then as we saw with the IMF disks, uh, you might create some like ISO disk image files that recreate the experience of, of loading in additional content on a physical storage device. And then you, you put all these things and combine them together and you get what we call an emulation environment. Um, if you're familiar in general with the concept of a virtual machine or a VM, um, you may have, have you know, uh, run into that concept elsewhere. Um, we are essentially talking about the same thing here. You could easily refer to one of our easy environments as a virtual machine. Uh, uh, we have generally been pushing the term environment instead for our context, just because we feel it's more descriptive of kind of the complex interplay that's happening here between these different components. Um, if you change or shift around any of these one things, either individually or, or in relation to each other, you've created a, a unique experience, a unique object. Every one of our computers, every one of our laptops that we're working on right now is a very particular um, combination, right, of software and hardware, different devices that we're all using. Um, and we're trying to get at through emulation, preserving that, that whole context. So depending on the, um, different emulation software you choose, you can recreate a whole different variety of different hardware systems. There are many, you know, if we, again, just think of the history of computing, there are obviously just been many, many companies, many brands, many models of hardware um, uh, that have been popular for computing. And likewise, there have been many pieces of emulation software developed often by open source software communities um, to recreate that variety of hardware. So just depending on what you choose, you could run Mac System 6 on your Windows 10 machine, you can run Windows 95 on whatever the latest Mac OS is. Um, if you are like me and really like to get into the weeds, you can go back to the 70s and run your Xerox Alto. Um, and, and, and if we take this and, and recreate these systems, we can thereby also take items like the IMF CD-ROMs and run and, reg and render digital objects as they were intended for those systems on your contemporary computer. And I would, I'd, I would point out at this point that using this technology, using emulators as an access strategy for digital collections, even though it's, it's 2020 now, this is not a new concept. You can go back to, um, I can point you to several seminal pieces in the, the mid 90s um, that discussed um, emulation as, as a, a way forward um, for, for providing access to um, digital archives and digital collections in a library and archives context. But there have been a lot of important advances just in like the last five to 10 years um, that make it really much more of a practical solution in the context of, of digital archives and, and cultural heritage institutions, which is what I want to lay out here. Um, so before we even get into the easy project of work, a really kind of important thing to clarify or a question we get a lot is what is emulation as a service, E-A-A-S? Um, it's a, it's, they're not quite the same thing, and I'm just going to define that here because about 10 years ago, uh, a team of researchers and developers at the University of Freiburg in Germany, uh, as part of a, a grant project called BWFLA, started this work to address the challenges of, of how do we take this amazing technology of all these different open source emulators that have been developed by the computing community um, and, and, and leverage them um, and, and scale them um, you know, to uh, the thousands of objects that are often contained at collecting institutions. So the, the emulation as a service framework, it, it enables users to, first of all, remotely access emulated environments via a web browser. So this is a um, great move forward just for, for access. Obviously, people are going to be more likely to want to access emulated environments over 
over the web than they are to want to come into a reading room where you've set up a, a, an emulator locally. Um, emulation as a service also has the benefit of abstracting interaction with some of the technical elements of, of emulators. They are often very um, picky <laughs> to, to, to set up on, on their own. Um, and, and so the, the emulation as a service platform sort of works at a higher level and allows um, users who are maybe not as familiar with the ins and outs of, of computing hardware and running emulators to focus on just sort of high level decisions like I mean, just operating, installing an operating system, something that they are more likely used to um, have done in their just sort of everyday use of computing. Uh, the emulation as a service platform also um, allows access all at once to many emulators um, or even multiple versions of the same emulator, um, which can be really great for just, I mean, broad compati compatibility. Again, when we're talking about consolidating and recreating the, the very wide range of possible hardware dependencies that you might encounter, you know, again, in a large collecting institution like a Stanford or a Yale where our, our, our digital collections go back decades. Um, instead of having to sort of separate out your efforts and, and, and figure out, uh, oh, I need an Apple II emulator. Oh, I need a Commodore emulator. Oh, I need a, sheep sh uh, a PowerPC Mac emulator and having to go out and, and follow the instructions for each of those programs individually. Um, you can just pop them all into emulation as a service and just sort of centralize all those different components. Um, and you can then save and return to those as, as any operating system, any combinations of software that you create using those emulators, you can return to them as persistent emulation environments, as persistent virtual machines, as we've um, already, already seen um, in the demos that, that Michael and Ron have shown us. Uh, and, and the last really great point kind of to make since uh, uh, Michael and Ron also brought up saving environments and, and, and sort of this process of, of creating derivatives or snapshots of the work that you did in a session in an emulator via the EAAS platform is that EAAS allows um, management of the underlying disk images and, and, and derivatives that drive all this work based on a, on sort of compressed uh, uh, and snapshot based storage, which is just to say that, um, say in, the, in this example that I have pulled up here, let's say you have some statistical analysis code dependent on a particular version of the, the application SPSS. Um, in this, this diagram here, every single one, each one of these three different machines is itself, it's, could be its own standalone environment and persistent environment. Um, even once you've, you've installed SPSS 13, um, after starting in Windows XP, you installed a program, you saved that as its own derivative, and then you installed code and saved that as another derivative. Each one of those you can return to if we had a different data set that also required SPSS 13, but we didn't want to save it in the same place as our original data set, we could do that if we wanted to go all the way back to Windows XP and then install Adobe Acrobat or, or just a completely different program, we could keep returning to the persistent Windows XP environment. But at each stage, we're not recreating the entire base. We're not um, recreating all of the storage that takes up the Windows XP operating system over and over again, which would quickly obviously fill up our, uh, our digital repositories, right? If we had to duplicate that data over and over again. So this is just to um, uh, uh, hype the, 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 the sort of data storage uh, uh, capabilities of EAAS in that it, it takes care of that for you and, and eliminates a lot of redundancy. Uh, so in addition to the EAAS framework and, and Freiburg's work over the past 10 years, um, we wanted to highlight that sort of another major move forward uh, that has made uh, emulation and software preservation more possible in an in a institutional cultural heritage context um, was this document developed in 2018 um, by the Association of Research Libraries in, in um, collaboration with the Software Preservation Network called the Code of Best Practices for Fair Use in Software Preservation. And this is really a legal um, guidance document to present to administrators and, and it was developed um, 
under the guidance of a, you know, a lot of, of, of um, copyright experts um, taking a look at the problem of, of proprietary software and copyright in a software context and, and whether libraries, archives, museums were uh, justified in their use and, and possibly distribution of proprietary software even if it's you know abandoned, even if it's old, um, were we justified in using old software for the purpose of providing access um, to legacy digital objects for research? Were we justified in in networking that software together and and allowing us to share? You know, if I have Adobe Acrobat Nine at Yale, can I can I give that to Stanford? Um, and all of which is to say you should read the entire document, but, but, but we basically got consensus, a critical consensus from, from the uh, copyright and, and legal community that yes, this is a, a, a fair use uh, under the legal um, copyright uh, um, definition of, of fair use um, to much like you know, Google um, scanning full copies of books in order to pro provide snippets for, for discovery and documentation and access purposes, um, we can share software amongst ourselves as well. So the, the, the easy program of work really wouldn't be possible without that sort of um, legal and administrative consensus. Um, and if you're interested in diving more into um, who the document applies to and, and who fair use in this context applies to. I mean, I really recommend you again, read the whole document. It's very accessible and readable um, even to non-copyright scholars like myself, but uh, uh, to note that there are a few guidelines for, for, for who it applies to and, and therefore sort of who can join our efforts in the software preservation network and, and in the easy program, we're talking about, you know, collections that are, are, are routinely made public or open to researchers, collections that were lawfully acquired somewhere by one of us, um, uh, software, or we're talking about institutions that have a public service mission and have trained staff or and you know volunteers that provide the usual library archive museum services. Um, so at that point, I think we have a few minutes before we're right on time. I think I have about five minutes. If there's any questions about these sort of like big picture topics that I've addressed so far. Um, I'd be happy to answer those for a few minutes before I think we'll do a quick coffee break and then I'll come back to talk about uh, more about easy and exactly what we're doing um, in, in the easy network. Um, hi, Ethan, this is Regina. I have a question about um, the, the software um, sort of in the back end when users are um, say they're interacting with the software through I mean uh, through like a library catalog or something um, <clears throat> would they be able to see how the software interacts um, like the back end sort of work that goes into creating the ISOs or do they just see the mm -hmm. emulator and that's it. Is there, can they see both at the same time? So our general vision for integrating like the IMF CD-ROM environment that you, you saw or emulation environments similar um, into like a library catalog or into a, a, you know, special collections access interface is usually to abstract as much as possible, which is to say probably the end user, the scholar, the student, um, whoever you're trying to do offer that you know data set up to in the end uh i mean our general assumption is in in those cases is that they don't care so much about about what we're doing on the back end about the emulator about what it took to to you know install um the specific version of of acrobat necessary to open a pdf from that time period they they just kind of want interaction um so so it, but it, it depends because we also realize that the context is important and there very well are also people we've encountered who do want to know those questions. And, and you know, there are people who are going to need a lot of guidance in, in how to even interact with legacy software. So we're thinking a lot about how to um, present supplementary information alongside uh, uh, emulation environments. 
to users um, and integrate that sort of supplementary information into a library catalog alongside the object in the first place, whether it's, again, help text over, you know, uh, like what Ron showed, like, hey, click, double click on the um, shortcut labeled my documents on the desktop when, you, when it boots up in order to get to the thing that you're trying to get to. Um, or whether it's, hey, here's some background information about what you're seeing and how it actually works um, and exposing that a little bit more. But, in, but as I say, in general, our, our assumption is that, you know, it, I mean, it's contextual, <laughs> but, but, but does that answer the question? Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. Does anyone else have questions for Ethan? I, I just wanted to jump in really quickly here and mention that uh, Jessica Meyerson mentioned in the chat that um, it looks like there's going to be some systematic work and end user studies kind of answering this. Mm. Um, so that's important. Yes. And I'll say like our, as I said, I'll get into with the easy program of work. I mean, we are really about putting the infrastructure in place for, for, people to do all sorts of, of things <laughs> for, for it to implement this technology. Um, so right, so we're, our, our goal is to build as, as flexible of a platform built on this technology as possible from which we can get a lot more sophisticated with how it's targeting certain user communities. Hi, Ethan, this is Ron. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the concept of the nodes and collaborative sharing versus mm -hmm. individual institutional kind of restricted use, uh, probably touching on the copyright or licensing issues that each institution has or software restrictions. Yes, I'll get into it um, in more detail in the second part of this presentation as well, but I think it's a good thing to point out here that basically one of the major developments that the EASY program of work has sponsored on top of the basic EAAS functionality that I just uh, discussed was to um, enable the sharing of resources between different installations of EAAS. So again, so it, what Freiburg had before, you know, they would install EAAS on their servers and anyone who was logged into, you know, their network could access that. But what we've introduced is this concept of, of if I install EAS at Yale and publish certain software installation media or publish certain emulation environments, then you at Stanford can fetch and make use of those same resources. And again, just ultimately the goal being there to reduce the redundant work that we're all doing in the field if we all need Adobe Acrobat 9.0. Um, and the focus there, I mean, with the copyright concerns is a really good one because I should say that the, the sharing and, and the distributed access uh, uh, the, the copyright concerns that are addressed in the code of, of, of best practices for fair use and software preservation is talking about software as a tool for getting to digital collections objects. So we are not assuming that people will be sharing like the, the IMF CD-ROM um, emulated environment that you created you would not necessarily, I mean, you, you have your copyright concerns that you got into, as you described in your presentation. Um, you wouldn't necessarily publish that to another institution like Yale to use because you have concerns about uh, that being accessed by people beyond the Stanford uh, uh, community. Um, but again, people who might need Windows XP or might need Adobe Acrobat 9 as a tool to get to you know, our own similar collections at our, our local institutions, that's what we're really trying to enable uh, uh, and, and help the infrastructure there. Does that, broadly speaking, answer the question? Yeah, thanks. And, and like you mm -hmm. said, you'll go probably a little bit more into it. Yes, in, yeah, in I'll definitely discuss it. Too. But yeah. it, it, it raises a bigger question for me, mm -hmm. which is, I, I understand what you just said, mm -hmm. but let's take in the case of, of my work where Stanford has the emulator running and they, they have a piece of copyrighted software that Stanford has a right to show people within the Stanford environment. Mm -hmm. um, is there any reason why somebody at Yale 
couldn't open up something at Stanford that has not just uh, Windows, you know, 10 running in it, but also has a uh, piece of copyrighted software in it, assuming that's okay with Stanford. It was, if it's so, okay yes, with Stanford, I, is it okay? Is there any reason why it can't be in the emulator all over the world? For, so one thing that we are working on is more sophisticated permissions management for, for sharing in, uh, emulation environments down, down the line, because absolutely there could be some cases where there, there are not copyright concerns and someone is perfectly happy with, as you sort of say, uh, someone at Stanford sharing a collection item via emulated environment to someone at another institution. We recognize that that's obviously a use case as well. Um, it's just, just sort of off the bat for like prototyping V1. We don't want to necessarily be managing everyone's digital collections for them. <laughs> uh, we're not trying to be a repository system. Um, so our, our, our focus is on the sharing of the software and of the emulations and, and, and putting a bit of a divide up between those tools and, and the collection items themselves. But that's absolutely, a, you know, of further discussion and interest and, and sometimes complicated. I mean, uh, the distinction between what is software and what is a collection item, I think as, as your pieces will show, Bob, is in itself sometimes um, a, a hard one to make. So uh, okay. discussion we're, we're, we're looking to have. 